you probably know that when things go wrong, they call the fire department. <laughs> Obviously for a fire, car accident, but actually if anything goes wrong, they call the fire department. I grew up in Dublin when the volunteer firemen all had radios in their cars and radios in their homes, and it was amazing how fast they could get to you if somebody called about you. So the first time they called the fire department about me was, <coughs> was when I was six. And um, Warren Whitney and I were walking home from school in Dublin down 101, something they would never let those kids do now. And we walked across this little pond that had just frozen over, it had an inch of snow on it. And I guess someone driving by must have been alarmed to see our footprints filling in with water. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we were back on the sidewalk and most of the way home when the fire chief arrived. It's Mike Worcester in his Ford pickup, the red light on top. He gets out of the car and he is this imposing authority figure. Broad, shoulders, flat, top. I don't remember him saying anything, but I do remember being absolutely terrified as he marched us back up into the school because I'm supposed to be a good kid and I'm not supposed to be in trouble. And now I'm in the principal's office and she is reaming us out for risking our lives on the thin ice. And she has called my mother and all I can process is I am in trouble. <laughs> the second time they called the fire department on me, <laughs> it was a year later. <laughs> we were at Warren Whitney's house, untended apparently. And uh, we decided to go cross-country skiing on the trail behind his house. And um, we didn't think we were lost, but uh, it sure was dark when they drove up behind us in two snowmobiles. <laughs> and uh, we're standing there in the glare of the headlights of the snowmobiles, and who steps off the front snowmobile? Chief Worcester. <laughs> that cold stare. Now it's two years later, and I'm over at Nian and Nikki Silich's house in Dublin. We're playing at hit their house after school. Their mom's not home because she works. And we get the bright idea that it would be fun to light napkins on fire. <laughs> we go outside. At least we decided to do that. Although it might have been better if we stayed inside, in retrospect, because it's a dry fall day and the wind is blowing. <laughs> And so we uh, decided the best place to do this is to stand in a carpet of leaves about 10 feet from their house. <laughs> and Ian lights the first napkin, burns his fingers, drops the napkin in the fire, and the leaves catch fire. Boom. Just like that. Okay. How do you put out a fire? You with water, of course. We go running inside, fill up teacups with uh, water <laughs> from the faucet. We go running outside, spill most of the water, try to extinguish the fire. It's not working. Fire's now five feet from the house, and I'm thinking, oh man, we are going to be in some serious <laughs> trouble. Just then, a man is driving by, stops his car, he must have seen the smoke, and he says, hey, what are you kids doing up there? But Ian's got it under control. He's like, oh, nothing. <laughs> it's fine, we're good, everything's under control. <laughs> Amazingly, the man drives away. <laughs> But he must not have thought we had everything under control because pretty soon after that, we hear the siren. And here comes the real life fire truck with all the firemen and they come and put the fire out. Who knew you could stamp out a fire? <laughs> they put the fire out and then Mike Worcester comes up to me and says, how did that fire start? And all I can do to stare at my shoes, I cannot bring myself to look him in the eye. Nor can I bring him, bring myself to look him in the eye ever again. <laughs> I see him around town, and I wasn't about to go up and approach him. I interpreted his stony silence as harsh judgment. What did he think of me, this kid who had caused all this trouble? <coughs> my parents invited Mike Worcester to my wedding. <laughs> along with everyone else in town. And I couldn't look him in the eye in the receiving line.
When I was about 28, I moved back to Dublin. I'd see Mike down at Car Store, which was his hangout, and he wouldn't even nod at me if we passed in the parking lot. And then the worst part was that when I was 35, I had to call the fire department on myself. <laughs> we had a chimney fire in our house. And I can tell you, I hesitated a long time before making that phone call. If my wife and children were in that house, I think I would have sooner let it burn. <laughs> but just last year, last year I went to Andy Elder's funeral in Dublin, and Mike Wister spoke at that funeral. And I think hearing Mike actually speak words <laughs> jarred something loose in me. Because I went up to him afterwards and I said, you know, I complimented him on his remarks, and we had a conversation. Mike spoke to me. He smiled at me. We didn't talk about the real issue because this is New England. <laughs> but that day, that last remaining chunk of shame deep inside me melted away. And who knows, maybe Mike Worcester never judged me that harshly after all. Maybe he just saw me for what I was, a free-range kid growing up in the woods of New Hampshire. <laughs>